Having more power is the best way to make a great snowmobile. Wrong! Roll the intro! Last season I made two of the most insane RC snowmobiles I've ever made on my channel. And if there's one thing I learned during that time, and something that I want to teach you today, is that having a lot of power is severely overrated. Let me explain. Shotkey, a one-of-a-kind, engineered specifically to be ultralight, homemade built remote control snowmobile, weighing only 2.8 kilograms, and Tachygon at over 10 horsepower, standing there as the most powerful remote control snowmobile ever. If I would only have to keep one as a daily driver, it would be Shotkey. I had the chance to drive both units for a decent amount of time. Shotkey is like the perfect workhorse. It's always reliable, predictable, it's always there when you need it. It just keeps on giving. Dikegon here is the high power one and it's the one that always makes you giggle by the stupid amount of power that it can unleash. It's the one that has so much to offer that you're actually scared of sending it by fear of flipping backward on itself or blowing everything to bits. Or both within the blink of an eye. So with all that being said, where am I going with this? Well, there's something I realized during last season, and it's something that can easily be explained by physics. Story time. When I was in high school, I failed one of my math classes. Yes, I was one of these kids. So that meant that to have my diploma, I had to redo my math, and I could not have access to the physics class in the last year. That was no big deal for me at the time. Less work to do, right? But then a few years later, I went in college, and I had two classes that were really important, thermodynamics of fluid and material properties, or something like that. And even though I was not the best kid in class, I passed. And a lot of the concept that we touched came back to me a few years later. But why is this relevant? Am I trying to make you like math and physics? No. But if you learn the basics and you try to apply them when you're designing something, it can save you both time and resources, but most importantly, it will make your creation better, lighter, stronger, and overall more optimized, all of that leading to a better overall experience. So maybe you'll see all that engineering as a worthy tool instead of a mandatory class to pass. The content of this video is geared more toward deep snow snowmobiles, but the concept discussed here can be easily applied to any vehicles, from miniature toys to full-size snowmobiles and everything in between. In this video, I'll explain why it's more important to have a lighter machine than a high power one. And in the following video, I'll explain some tips and tricks on how to save weight and overall optimize your creations. Chapter 1. Power to Rate Ratio I'm sure most of you have heard of this one. If you have a 300 horsepower car that weighs 3,000 pounds, it's going to have the same power to rate ratio and thus the same acceleration as a 500 horsepower car that weighs 5,000 pounds. Because both have the same power to rate ratio of 1 to 10, or 10 to 1, depending on how you want to see it. What all of this comes down to is acceleration. That is assuming that everything is equal as far as friction and efficiency goes, but the concept stays the same. But there's more to this concept than just power to rate ratio. A heavier car might have a harder time accelerating because the heavier car might have less traction. It's a heavier car after all, it takes more force to put it up to speed. In the snowmobile world, the traction issue is partially solved just by the large surface area of the track, but there is nonetheless some observable side effects. Which brings us to the second factor, which is probably the most important of them all. Chapter 2. Surface Area to Weight Ratio If you have a narrow track in a heavy machine, the heavier unit will result in a higher pressure on the ground, which is the correct term to describe a force over a surface area. This measurement is especially important in the snowmobile world because the surface we drive in, i.e. snow, is soft and loose. Unlike on a hard surface like asphalt, having a high ground pressure over snow is not advised because it will inadvertently result in what's known as trenching. For the unfamiliar, that is when the snowmobile digs down and is unable to drive forward and over the snow and keep going. That means you're stuck! The baseline is, if you have a heavy machine that has a lot of weight on it, it doesn't matter what kind of power you have in front of it, if the snow below you cannot support the pressure, you will trench. But a good rider won't get stuck. True, 
A good rider will make sure the pressure is low at all time by avoiding doing wheelies all over the place, which reduces the surface area of his track, thus avoids getting stuck. Or at least doing wheelies where the snow can support it, or even trade some of his inertia to reduce the surface area of his track for a small amount of time. And while we're on the topic of inertia, let's talk about it. Chapter 3. Inertia. You've probably heard about Newton's first law. An object at rest stays at rest, and an object in motion stays in motion with the same speed and the same direction unless acted upon by unbalanced poles. Basically what it boils down to is, let's say you're stopped and doing a side hill, and you want to start moving again. The snowmobile, the snow surrounding it, and even you are trying to prevent that movement from happening. The opposite is also true. If your snowmobile is going forward and you want to slow down, the snowmobile wants to keep going. And it would keep on going forever if it was not for the friction happening all over it. We're talking air drag, track friction, the wheels, even the oil in a chain case is trying to slow you down. That is why you eventually come to a stop in the real world. But the inertia is still there. This is all good and sweet, but what I'm interested in here is lateral forces. Or steering forces, basically. Let's suppose you want to change direction. Power has nothing to do with it. But the mass of the snowmobile does. Let's say you have a snowmobile that weighs 2.8 kilograms. Hi Chucky! And you want to turn at a rate of 0.08 meters per second. You can calculate the force to turn at 0.224 newtons. Now, let's take the same turning radius, but apply it to Decagon, which weighs about 4.5 kilograms. Now, the force it takes to turn is 0.34 newtons to do the same work. That's around 60% more. The difference is the snowmobile is requiring a bigger force to do the same work because the mass is also higher and thus more work is required. All this basically means is the lighter the snowmobile, the more reactive or flickable it is going to be. I know this might not be the most important point in a remote control snowmobile, but in a full-size snowmobile or in any motorsport for that matter, it does play a significant difference. I hope you start to understand why it's important to save weight, but there's one more thing we need to talk about and it has nothing to do with performance. It's all about reliability. Chapter four, reliability. Let's say you have a remote control snowmobile that's going, let's say 30 kilometers per hour, and it hits a hard place, like a big rock, for example. The snowmobile is gonna come to a full stop in a few milliseconds. It has a certain amount of energy going in. It is supplied over a small area. Let's say now the snowmobile weighs, again, 2.8 kilograms and it comes to a full stop in, let's say, 15 milliseconds. The snowmobile would experience a force of 1,555 newtons. Now, that's a bit tough to visualize. So, for reference, the average force a man standing up applies to the ground is around 700 newtons. For a fraction of a second, it's like having two people stand on the snowmobile. All of that applied over a small surface. That's a lot. But let's say your snowmobile weighs more. Let's say, again, 4.5 kilogram like Decagon. The number steps up to 2,500 newtons, or like three and a half guys. All of that over the same surface area. You can understand now the chance of breaking something increases a lot. So just to recap, a lighter machine has a smaller chance of breaking something because the force applied over the same surface area is also reduced, thus reducing the chance of breaking something. Just for fun, I did a small scenario where Decagon here would come to a full stop from his maximum theoretical motor safe limit of 101 kilometers per hour, with current gearing, of course. And it would stop again in like 15 milliseconds. That would produce a staggering 8,416 newtons, or roughly the weight of 12 people. Needless to say, there would not be a lot left of that snowmobile. Chapter five, conclusion. So when you take everything into account, you see there's quite a difference between a car accelerating and a snowmobile. Saving weight here is important on two fronts because usually no amount of power will make your snowmobile float. I say usually, but we'll get back to that in a second. So saving weight makes your snowmobile both accelerate faster and trench less, resulting in a better overall snow crossing capability. Saving weight also makes the snowmobile more agile and easier to change direction. All that with a smaller effort required. And finally, a lighter snowmobile has a smaller kinetic energy, so it has a smaller chance of breaking itself when you hit something. It's basically reducing the chance of having a rapid, unscheduled disassembly. 
There's also some other things we didn't talk about today, like for example, the heat management. If you have a bigger motor, bigger speed controller that pulls more amps, you have a higher chance that your entire system will get hotter and thus you need to deal with that. It will also probably drain the same battery quicker, so you might need to have a bigger battery to maintain your duration. And again, this will add weight. But I don't want to talk about these today. We already talked about a lot of stuff and I don't want to add to this. What I want you to know is that there's not a lot of advantages to having more power. Even though nothing makes you giggle more than having power that you're afraid to hit. If you liked this video or found some of the information useful, some of your builder's buddy might like it as well. So considering sharing the link. Or you can keep all these sweet information for yourself so you can beat your buddies when you compare against them. It's up to you. That being said, I'll do a video soon explaining how to make a lighter snowmobile and give some tips and tricks on how to do it. Prepare yourself this year. I'm saving weight for real this time. See you soon. I say usually no amount of power will make your snowmobile float, except in some rare scenario where you have so much track speed and so much power, then the sheer force of the snow getting swung out propels the snowmobile forward. Woo! Rooster tails! After all, Newton's third law, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Science. Legend says Newton was a snowmobiler. <laughs>